We have one more passage to read, and this is, will be our text on which the sermon is based today. This time from 1 Samuel 18. This is uh, immediately following David's um, victory over Goliath. It's the previous chapter, the famous David versus Goliath story. And after David defeats Goliath, he talks to the king of Israel, King Saul. And then we have the following verses in ver chapter 18, starting at verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Thus far, our text. Brothers and sisters and friends and family, we've read a lot of different passages today. These passages are all centered on the story of David and Jonathan. David is a shepherd boy from Bethlehem, really of no status. Jonathan is the son of the king of Israel, the son of King Saul. And Jonathan and David develop one of the most vivid and intimate friendships of the Bible, perhaps of all time, even we could say. Jonathan and David love each other. They have a complete commitment to self-sacrifice for each other. They're willing to do anything. And the story is a beautiful story, and we read through a lot of it, and we'll talk more about it as the sermon goes on. But today I want to say that the story of David and Jonathan is not written purely so that it can be admired. And certainly it is admirable, the friendship that they have. But the question we have to ask when we read the story of David and Jonathan is, why does the Bible spend so much time on this? Why do we hear again and again about the details of their friendship? What's, what's, what's this meant to teach us? What are we going to learn from this today? And the answer that I hope to explore with you today is that David and Jonathan's friendship shows us something about God and also about how God works in his people. Of course, the whole Bible says that, but today we're going to learn particularly why that's the case. And particularly, the story of David and Jonathan shows us something about Jesus and how Jesus Christ relates to us. In fact, the story of David and Jonathan, in some ways, is the epitome and the pinnacle of what human relationships on earth could be. And in that sense, it teaches us a lot about what Jesus is trying to do right here in this church. And so follow with me as we look at these story, this account, under this theme. In Christ, we find the way to the highest companionship. And we'll see first the basis for the highest companionship. And number two, the nature of the highest companionship. And so as we begin, let's orient ourselves briefly so that we understand where we are in the Bible. Remember, this is 1 Samuel. This is a story of the nation Israel in the Old Testament, a nation that is God's nation. God chooses what happens in his nation, and God chooses who rules his nation. And what's happened in Israel is that King Saul has gained power. And King Saul has been shown to be an evil king. And so God has punished King Saul by, by choosing a new king, which will be David. But David has not become king yet in the passages that we read. And Saul is becoming increasingly jealous of David as time goes on, he does not like David. He sees the threat that David is to his kingdom. But he forgets that his kingdom does not belong to him. It belongs to God. And so 
where we are right now is chapter 17. David enters the scene and he, he defeats Goliath in this great victory over the, their Philistine enemies. And after his victory, he then comes to talk to King Saul. And our text today begins with these words. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. This is a very curious thing. At the same time that the king of Israel is increasingly jealous and is increasingly uh, opposed to David, the heir to the throne, Jonathan, King Saul's son, develops this intense and powerful friendship with David. And at this point, and we'll talk more about this, but at this point we need to think about why in this moment does Jonathan develop this incredible affection for David? Like, what, what brings this on? I think some people, we sometimes think that relationships are entirely random. It's like, uh, you know, it says in Proverbs, the teacher in Proverbs says there are four things he doesn't understand, and one of them is the way of a man with a maiden. And the point that he's making is, you know, people date each other and they get married, and from the outside it's impossible to figure out why. It seems completely random. So should we look at the story of David and Jonathan and say, wow, well, you know, Jonathan and David became friends? It's just a totally random serendipitous event. I would say, no, this is not a random event. There's reasons why this happened. And these are particularly, there's reasons why Jonathan's affections are so stirred up in this moment. In fact, C.S. Lewis once wrote about friendship in his book, The Four Loves. And he, he commented, he said, listen, every friendship is based on a, a, a shared truth. Two people become friends when they, they realize that they, they see the same thing together in a, in a kind of a unique way. There's this sense of, oh, hey, you too? You see what I see? And then their hearts connect. And in reality, this shared truth can be anything. It can be a shared interest in disc golf or seeing motherhood the same way or a certain perspective on cross-stitch or knitting. I've seen it happen. And so what truth do Jonathan and David see together that sparks affection? The point is, they both have a deep emotional attachment and relationship to God. And they see the same thing in Israel. They see Israel's battles with its enemies as spiritual battles. And they're tired of seeing Israel lose to the Philistines. And so victory becomes this. They, when they see victory in each other, their, their hearts are stirred. Wow, you fought for God, David? And you might ask, well, how do I know that Jonathan has a strong faith? Remember that we read 1 Samuel 14. This is an earlier chapter. In 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan attacks a Philistine outpost and has this stunning victory. What's fascinating is that Jonathan's attack on the Philistine outpost in that chapter is an act of faith. Look what Jonathan says in verse 6 of chapter 14. He says this. He says, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. And now here's a key line. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. It's a stunning act of faith, one that we would be hard-pressed to imitate. And John, the Lord gives Jonathan victory over an incredibly risky attack. And the key is that Jonathan's attack on this Philistine outpost is not so different than David's attack on Goliath. And David's attack on Goliath was faith-based. But David says to Goliath, and he says, Look, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
So David sees his battles as a matter of faith, and so does Jonathan. Now let's keep in mind, this is the Old Testament. God worked differently in the people in the Old Testament than today. We are not called to go into battle. No nation on earth today can claim to have God on their side and go into battle, so to speak, like David and Jonathan did. Jesus has come and we live in a new age where God works differently. But nonetheless, in this time, Israel was, versus, Israel was God's nation and all the other nations wanted to destroy Israel and were against God. Even Goliath mocks God. And David says, enough. I will not have that. And so when Don, Jonathan sees David's courageous defeat of Goliath, his heart is stirred. This is the very thing he wants to see. And Jonathan and David share a powerful faith together. Both are ready to fight for God's kingdom and God's cause. And their hearts are united by this. This is where I think David and Jonathan's relationship begins to teach us. It doesn't teach us that we need to put armor on and fight for God. What it does is it teaches us about our relationships today, which are really not so different. It teaches us that the higher the truth at the basis and foundation of your relationship, the stronger your relationship can become. And the more intimate you can become. Right? Think about it. You may have a friendship with someone for various reasons. Right? I talked about cross-stitch. Then it may be a good friendship. Or maybe you play golf together. Or maybe you are both fans of the Tiger Cats, unfortunately. Or maybe you've, you cheer for the Maple Leafs and your relationship is bonded on wallowing in misery together. And these friendships can be good and beneficial. Shared truths. But your relationship can only go so far as the idea at the, at the center, however much fright it can bear, is as far as your relationship is going to go. And you'll notice that. Your relationship can't go very far if you're this, the person you're with doesn't share the same truths about all of reality. But let's imagine now that you meet someone and they share the same truths as you do in the bottom of their heart about the whole universe and about who's in charge of it all and who created it all and who is leading it to a conclusion. Let's imagine that you not only share send truths together, but you share a person who lives in heaven named Jesus. How far can your relationship go then? Your relationship's going to have a very different character. In fact, you are going to have access to the highest companionship available to a human being. And this is true for all types of relationships. One pastor once said, our companionships bear testimony to our natures and our convictions. And if we back up a little bit, this is true in our relationship with God too, eh? If we submit to God's truth and we want to say the same thing about our reality that God says, that's going to be a basis for us to unite with God too. In fact, look what Jesus says in John 15. It's fascinating what Jesus says. He's talking to his disciples before he dies. And he says this, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Hold on, see that? A servant doesn't know his master's business, but we do. We know Jesus' business. We share truths with him. He's given us his revelation of himself and all of reality, and we now possess that. And therefore, there's, we're, we're a step up from servant. He calls us friends. Friends. 
Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father. I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. And so Jesus, of course, he's more than our friend. He's also our Lord and King. Don't forget that. So I get a little bit uncomfortable when people say, um, Jesus is my best friend. Yes, but <laughs> he's also more. But nonetheless, the position of friendship is very real. And there's also a sense of Jonathan in this too. Right? When, when David has this stunning act of heroism, he, he defeats Goliath. Jonathan responds, and part of the reason he responds is because he sees this heroism of faith. And there's a sense in which Jesus defeats sin in the same way David defeats Goliath. And when we see what Jesus has done, it should stir our hearts to love him too. And like Jonathan, our hearts should be stirred by our Lord. And second, we can think of other relationships. Marriage, of course, is another one that would fit this. Marriage, of course, contains a different type of love than companionship or friendship too, right? What the Greeks would call eros or romantic love. But it, the strongest marriages also contain what the Greeks called phileo, the friendship love. A good marriage, of course, has eros, but at some point, and it's often started based on what we would call eros, but it, over time, the phileo was the strength that really binds it. Now let's imagine that you have a marriage and you don't share Christ. And that you have differences at the core of your marriage that's going to be hard to build the kind of intimacy over the future. It's not impossible, but it's going to be hard. But if you share a relationship with a person in heaven and you share his views on all of reality and the central truths... You're going to have access to the highest companionship in your marriage. Of course, it doesn't happen for everyone. We still sin, but still, the preconditions exist for David and Jonathan Phileo to live in your marriage. And yes, we could third, we could talk about Christian friendship. You know, I can speak from personal experience on this front. I've had many friends in life, not all of them Christian. Yeah, you can get close to people who don't share the same truths. You can be good friends. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't compare to the kind of depth of friendship you'll have with someone who sees reality exactly like you do. There are, you know, David and Jonathan doesn't seem so foreign to me when I think about the friendships that I've had with people and still have with people who know Jesus. You have this affection for each other that, and, and there's this, uh, David and Jonathan, they make a covenant, right? They make promises to each other that last, right? And you have that with your Christian friends. You don't stop being friends with them. Your, your relationship continues with them because they're not going to change and you're not going to change on what matters. A certain Native American tribe has an interesting term for friend. They don't have a word for friend, so to speak, so... The term that they use to describe a friend is this. They say, one who carries my sorrows on his back. It's a curious uh, translation. Or another definition for friend, as I found, is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Here's another one. One who multiplies joys and divides grief. The point being, brothers and sisters, the friendship of Jonathan and David is possible in Jesus. It's beautiful. But it's hard to imagine that level of friendship with, if you don't agree on the basic and most fundamental truths. If you don't agree on what the main person in all reality is doing. Not that it's completely impossible, but it's just hard. And fourth, we could, t we could also talk about what I would call fellowship. 
In, in basic terms, we would mean the fellowship of the church. And Jesus places all of us in a church. The Bible's very clear on that. Nobody can live without a body of local believers. Paul never wrote a letter to uh, someone who wasn't involved in the body of local believers. What's fascinating is C.S. Lewis once said, you know, what's fascinating about a church is that Jesus is essentially saying to all of us, you have not chosen each other, but I have chosen all of you for each other. It's in a local church that we realize even more powerfully what Jesus is doing in our lives. Right? Lewis says, a reward for our discrimination, our, our congregation and the relationships we have, they're not a reward for how smart we are or how good we are at picking friends. And he says the local congregation is an instrument by which God reveals the beauties of everybody to each other. There's a sense in which certain things about a person can never be revealed unless they're around other people, and certain people even. You're diminished unless you're surrounded by people who can bring out your faith, and who can bring out your wisdom, and who can bring out your laughter. So one of the things that David and Jonathan teaches us is that human companionship can be that high. Even in the church. Now I get it. We don't necessarily all feel that in the church. We often feel isolated. We often struggle to make friends, even in Christ's body. Sin divides us. Petty differences lead us to isolate ourselves and feel that we can't be vulnerable. Fear distorts our feelings and affections and teaches us that we're better off alone, which is wrong and just false. Selfishness leads us to think we don't need each other. We just manage on our own, thank you very much. Of course, let's remember that Jesus didn't live life alone either, so neither should you. It's also true that not everyone will have the same depth of relationship with everyone else. It's true. We all live our, our, our journey with Christ a little bit differently. It's not bad. And we're not Jesus. We're not capable of living, giving all of our love to 100 people at once. God carefully bounds our lives and leads us into contact with certain people at certain times, and that's okay. In fact, God brought Jonathan to David to comfort David in his life. Right? They had that friendship. They weren't friends like that with everybody. But even so, even with all those qualifications and qualifiers I've given you, there's a sense in which the church is that place where the unique companionship, the highest companionship becomes available. It's our job to begin to work that out. The vision of Jesus is no less true and compelling just because we're too sinful to always live it out. This leads us to our second point, the nature of the highest companionship. There's more to David and Jonathan's gospel friendship. Look at verse 3. It says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. It's fascinating that in Jonathan and David's relationship, they, there's this implicit acknowledgement that their feelings are not enough. They surround their feelings with promises. It's like marriage, almost. Marriage is also a covenant. They make lifelong promises to each other to bound their feelings in, in, in a, like a knot, you could say. What's fascinating is that their covenant mirrors God's relationship with us. God made a covenant with his people. And God loves us and he surrounds his love with these covenant promises that never change. In fact, Jesus calls the Lord's Supper, the, if you drink the wine at the Lord's Supper or, or the communion, that's the blood of the covenant. What is a covenant? It's a formalized relationship. Relationship. 
A relationship bound with agreements and promises that we both agree to. And if our, you know, if our relationships are, are based on the promises of God and based on the truths of God, it's entirely appropriate. We would make promises to each other, like the promises of church membership, for example, right? We don't just rely on feeling our love. We, we, we may bound our love in promise. So Jonathan made a covenant because he loved David as himself. And then it's the, the next verse, he follows this up with action. Right, verse 4. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And this is a highly significant act. One commentator says it this way. The fact that Jonathan gave David the garb and the armaments originally reserved for the heir to the soul's throne. This fact clearly possesses symbolic and thematic significance. In other words, Jonathan is the heir. Jonathan is meant to rule Israel after Saul dies. And Jonathan in this moment says, I'm going to give you the trappings of my office. It's like giving someone your marriage ring. It's highly significant. And so Jonathan is saying to David, I'm ready to give up the kingdom because I love you that much. And curiously, we read in 1 Samuel 23, verse 17, Jonathan recognizes that David is going to become king and that Jonathan will not. Look what he says in verse 17. He said, And Saul's Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. And then he says, You will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father knows this. I want to think about that for a second. What kind of man gives up an entire kingdom for his brother? For a shepherd boy with no status. What kind of love is that? And so we suddenly realize that David is not the only hero of these chapters. Jonathan in many ways shows a superior faith and love than even David. He's the one who has the most to lose if David becomes king. And yet, he's ready. There's no selfishness in his heart whatsoever. He shares the same vision of life as David. He shares the same faith and he sees that God's kingdom, it's about what God wants, not about what he wants. And he's, okay, this is what it is, then this is what it is. I'll give you my weapons. The fact is, brothers and sisters, is that we learn something about God here. Because such love is not human, really. It's love that comes from God. In fact, it's the kind of love that Jesus had when he died for us too. Remember what it says in Philippians 1? Or Philippians 2, rather, verse 6. Jesus comes to earth, and look what it says. Being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so what we see in Jonathan is the love of Christ. The kind of love that would develop in a person if they know Jesus and if they know God. It's the kind of love that God produces in someone when they put their faith in him. And if this is the kind of love that God produces in the heart of his people, then the highest companionship is available to us. It comes when we offer our love to other people. 
It comes when we come to give. It comes when we pray God into our lives in such a way that our hearts are, that the pride in our hearts is crushed and broken. There's an old maxim I once read. It said, you know, I went out to find a friend, but could not find one there. I went out to be a friend, and friends were everywhere. This is fundamentally how the church works. Another pastor once said, he said, you know, the best of friends are they that deny themselves pleasure for the sake of making me better. It is they who incur the risk of anger and the dislocation of friendship for the sake of telling me a truth that nobody else dares to tell me. The best friends are those that seek to be a physician of my soul. They are my best friends. Basically, he summed up not only friendship, but pastoral ministry. And again, we realize that no one person perfectly does this. Even Jonathan and David were not perfect. But in Christ, what happened in their lives was beautiful and glorifying to God and is not unique to them. Jesus denied himself pleasure and endured pain and suffering so that he can produce the companionship of David and Jonathan between us and him and between each other as Christians. And so Jesus gives me a life in which I am surrounded by the highest of companions. Marriages based on faith. The church, Christian friendships based on the vulnerability of friends. Again, Lewis commented on this when he said, in each of my friends, there is something that only some other friend can bring out. And I think this is the beauty of David and Jonathan again. We are diminished unless other people surround us. And in this way, the maximum of glory due to God is not achieved when we are alone. This is, of course, assuming that our being alone is not our choice or is our choice. And in fact, what we see in David Jonathan more than anything is a glimmer of heaven. Their friendship exhibits this sort of resemblance to the kind of joy that we will experience with each other in heaven. And in that sense, we have to be realistic about what we'll see today. We can't have everything in this life because we're sinners. But at least in David and Jonathan, at the very least, if nothing else, you have a vision of what heaven is going to be like and a vision of the kind of beauty and the kind of relationship you will have with every single other person it will be even richer. And, let's not forget, that what David and Jonathan had, Christ has with you except even better. Christ is even more loving and even more giving and his promises are even sure than the promises you see here. And he gives it all to you. Just as Jonathan is willing to give the kingdom to David, Jesus gives his kingdom to you for your sake. So brothers and sisters, today the message is as it always is. Come to Jesus and this beauty becomes yours. If you're here and you can't submit to Jesus' lordship, then you necessarily have to recognize that you will not experience the highest companionship on this earth. You will be diminished. If you're the center of your existence, then you must therefore be distant from everyone else. But if you can submit to Christ, and he can then lead you to submit to everybody and grant you the beauty of David and Jonathan. Maybe not perfectly, no. Maybe you won't have exactly what they have, no. But the beauty that they had will begin to enter your life in Christ. Amen.